sorry, we're running a little late. We had some technical difficulties. Um, I'm Ali Khudur. I'm going to be moderating this session. And uh, first up, we have a lecture by Francisco Gonzalez de Canales. He's going to be our second keynote speaker for our conference this year. Uh, Francisco Gonzalez de Canales is a professor of architectural history, theory, composition, and a unit master at the Architectural Association since 2008. Gonzalez de Canales studied architecture at ETSA Seville, ETSA Barcelona, and Harvard University, and worked for Foster and Partners and Rafael Moneo before establishing Canales and Lombardero, an award-winning office based in London and Seville. From 2002 to 2007, he got the FBI and the La Caixa scholarships, which helped him to develop his own research interests at the University of Seville, UNAM Católica de Chile, and Harvard University, where he received the Dimitris Picionis Award in 2007. He has been a teaching fellow at Harvard University and the Boston Architectural College, a visiting professor at the Instituto Tecnológico de Monterrey and City University of London. He has published more than 30 articles in academic journals in his field, and among his recent books are First Works, Experiments with Life Itself, Rafael Moneo, A Theory Through Practicing, Rafael Moneo, Building, Writing te and Teaching, and Politics and Digital Fabrication. So please give a warm welcome to Francisco. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here presenting part of my research and, and work from, from the office, if I have the time to present it, because uh, it comes a bit, little bit at the end of, of this uh, short lecture. Um, the name of it is somehow reflecting on some of the issues that the conference was uh, proposing, and I think that it might sound, might sound a bit scary to, to use cultural conflict, you know, and, and it is not. In my view, I think that uh, cultural conflict is also related to our way in which we are able to allow plurality in our society. It's a way in which we are able to administrate dissent, not only in terms of verbalization of dissent, but also in terms of how we want to live in our cities. So I want to develop this through uh, certain theories, especially coming from Latin American critical studies, and also using some historical references to illustrate it. Uh, I think that everyone is more or less familiar with, I don't know if this is, this is only a pointer, no? So there, there are, like this, okay with a canonical test by uh, Ren Kulhas when he was uh, describing the generic city. Um, it was uh, a description in which it was very difficult to, to the pictures as well, not to really see anything. It's this notion of homogeneity that is mostly based, based on the idea of not being able to distinguish one thing from another. And uh, we have to understand that this uh, approach uh, taken by Ren Kulhas, in a way, was also the result of uh, uh, confrontation towards the uh, intellectual status quo of his time, especially the work developed by anthropologists like uh, Marc Auger, also even the conference, uh, the ANY conference, Anywhere, where most of the architects of his time in 1992 were positioned towards uh, new responsibility towards the con context, towards the city, towards all these things that, for instance, were developed by Rafael Moneo in the murmur of the side. So his position was polemical and, in a way, confronting this kind of status quo and saying that probably this homogenization that we were witnessing today could be understood also as a movement of global liberalization that says something that down with character. So uh, for a certain time, this was an idea that was appealing to architects, but the reality is that when we were approaching the reality of the city itself, we couldn't find this process of homogenization. Maybe if you look at it superficially, and this kind of big statistics and so on, you can find that this thing, this thing, this thing, this other thing, these, these are almost the same, and this is how 
many parts of the, let's say, developing world, that I don't like to use that expression, but it's how uh, these people putting data together, they normally say things like that. This is what you find everywhere. The, the, the cities are developing with this kind of a schemes. It doesn't matter if the first thing that you saw was Panama, the second is Mumbai, the third is Shenzhen, this is Shanghai, this is Santiago in Chile, this is Seville, this is one of the cities where I live. Um, it doesn't matter, it's repeating the same kind of uh, urban development here, there, everywhere in the world. But the reality is that this is only when we look at it from the distance. When we don't look at it from data and we don't look at the real practices that are occurring in these cities. Because if you look at London that is developing its own skyline in recent years, you can have this image and say, okay, they're producing these icons. It's kind of it's what is happening everywhere else in the world. But you go down to two streets, four streets, uh, kind of back from this uh, skyline and you find something like that. So you see over there, the gherkin is a bit blur. You see it? So, and this is what is happening in the street. I don't know if this is an image of homogeneity. It's a very weird one. It doesn't represent homogeneity at all. What is happening is that the non-homogeneous practices of the people in the cities is what's creating a kind of cultural character that is not a cultural character that can be defined as univocus, it cannot be defined as unitarian, it cannot be defined as cohesive, but it's all these kind of, I would say, conflicting different ways of living the city, walking the city, dressing in the city, eating in the city, different ways of positioning yourself towards the city in the end. Happens everywhere, like you go to Hong Kong, typical sky, and then you go during a Sunday, as you see these very particular, strange gatherings of Filipino people in the, uh, let's say, the ground floor of uh, Foster's uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank. And you go to Miami, okay, this is the very generic suburban development that is happening all across the world and specifically in the US. And you zoom in, because this is the Google that say, okay, all the people is living with the American dream and so on, and you start to see things like that. No, there is a typical coffee shop that is attached to a house, and they have this very specific from Miami walk-through uh, coffee uh, window. That is a place where the people come, they park their cars, they come to the window, they have the coffee at the window with other people, and they, they take their car and go back. That is very different from the typical American taking your 7-Eleven cup of coffee, you know, getting into the car, because these people understood that the most valuable thing about having coffee is the conversation that you have having coffee and not having the coffee itself that is meaningless, no? So in a way, all these kind of things are very particular to, to, to a context, to a way of inhabiting that is conflicting to others, no? Like you see one thing with another, without, they're very different to each other and they don't represent this homogeneity that everyone says that is happening across the world. So I would say that probably, and this is another picture of Whitechapel again, with all these kind of different uh, people uh, living together, I would say that uh, what is happening in a way is that the, the cultural kind of uh, practice is not anymore uh, confined by a certain territory, it's not only confined by a certain region, by a certain city, in a way going to the scale of the practice of the people, of the individual, of a group of individuals. So there is a kind of uh, reconnection of how culture is unfolding in the city that is not depending so much on a kind of integral cohesiveness of the culture itself, but on all these different cultures that are happening at the same time. So, uh, across the 90s and the beginning of the 21st century, uh, there were different theories to define this idea of how the culture is, in a way, live in the cities. And I normally refer to these basic uh, notions. One, uh, normally understood of multi-communitarism, uh, that uh, is happening in many places. So the culture is allocated in different ethnics or, or ethnic or cultural uh, enclaves that is probably happening 
here, and I think that I witnessed uh, kind of this kind of organization. Normally, uh, all uh, theorists, they say that uh, it's, I wouldn't say dangerous, but it's not a very stable way of organizing the city because it's generating a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, discomfort between the different communities. There is a, a lot of uh, lack of, lack of confidence. You, know, you say, "Oh, what is happening in these uh, places?" So, so normally, th this has been rejected uh, in the way in which we plan the city and say, "Okay, we should avoid avoid the, this kind of multi communities." And there is the other thing that normally is named multiculturalism. That is the one that actually uh, reactionary politicians in Europe they're saying that. It is a failure and it's not working anymore. But in reality, if we look at it in the, in the way that is happening in many cities, even in some places in London, this multiculturalism is not so much uh, just a free mix of cultures, but there is always a kind of hierarchy between the way in which the cultures are mixed. And I think that in many cases, what is happening is that there is a superficial assimilation for external cultural features from a central and dominant culture. The way in which we like to go to eat Japanese food or poke or whatever, but it's from our perspective or from a way of living, but we take a little bit of it. We uh, are dressing cowboy boots because it's fashion. I don't know, all these kind of things that we do that actually are not talking about a mix of cultures, but it's an appropriation from a central and dominant culture that is different from what I'm trying to propose today. Uh, that is much more related to a critical tradition that is uh, born in Latin America and that is named transculturation. Transculturation is something that was, it's a term that was coined by Fernando Ortiz, that is a Cuban anthropologist uh, in the 40s, in the beginning of the 40s actually, uh, is independent from other uh, post-colonial critical approaches that started also in the 40-50s uh, with Franz Fanon, etc. Uh, and it's talking about these cultural relationships in a different way. Uh, Fernando Ortiz uh, defines transculturation as a set of ongoing transmutation that never ceases. It is always a process in which the two parts of the equation et end up being modified. From this process it springs out a new reality, which is not a patchwork of features, but a new phenomenon, original and independent. And I think that one of the very important definitions of this uh, term is not being a patchwork of features, no? and very much against uh, one cultural theory that was very prevalent, especially in the US, but at that time that was the theory of the melting pot. No? And I'm considering that uh, we are creating new nation states by putting together different uh, cultural features from uh, different kind of origins. No? And we melt them into a pot and we create this new kind of uh, culture for the uh, nation state. No, I think that this kind of uh, arrangement is trying to, or this uh, theoretical uh, proposition is trying to avoid this idea of the melting pot. Uh, it's avoiding it by saying that it's a dynamic process of, of confrontation, um, uh, by saying that it's a cultural organization which prevents the possibility of any stable fusion or synthesis. Um, the, I will come later to, to, to these uh, definitions, but I wanted also to say that the, uh, theory, the theoretical approach uh, began uh, uh, with uh, the book of Contrapunteo Cubano uh, del Tabaco y el Azúcar that we are seeing here. It was something that was followed by other Latin American uh, important uh, intellectuals, like for instance, Jose Maria Arguedas that was a uh, writer and anthropologist is one of the m most, uh, I think, important uh, representatives of, of the, the writers uh, in Latin America that became uh, very relevant in the 60s and 70s, like um, Gabriel García Márquez or Juan Rulfo or uh, Mario Vargas Llosa and Arguedas that was also Peruvian and who uh, was living all his childhood surrounded by indigenous people, um, that he reflected on that experience in Los Rios Profundos. This book, I, the, there is uh, an English version of it. I don't know if, the, I guess there is also a French, I'm not sure about an Arabic version of, of this book, but it's 
tell me about this uh, way in which uh, your experience with this indigenous people uh, when he was not able to speak Quechua himself uh, was a kind of attempt to translate an experience that didn't have a language yet. And, and I think that this kind of process of mutual understanding and mutual uh, kind of uh, approach to uh, cultural behavior was is a leading force in the writings and in the thinking of Jose Maria Arguedas that also was in a way condensed in uh, this book, uh, Formación de una Cultura Nacional Indoamericana, where he's positing his uh, approach to transculturation from his own perspective, a perspective that, that's, that was also taken by Angel Rama, that is probably the most important critical theorist, and his book, Transculturation, or Transculturación Narrativa en America Latina, was actually dealing with the authors that I was mentioning before, García Márquez, Rulfo, describing how this uh, uh, Macondo that uh, García Márquez used to, 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 to use as an imaginary territory, or Colima, that is the imaginary territory of Juan Rulfo, was always a reality that didn't have a language yet. And, and the different approaches to this kind of description of this complex reality. And the, the good thing about uh, uh, Angel Rama is that he also made a translation of that to uh, the way in which people inhabit the city in a book that is La Ciudad Letrada, the letter city that you see on, on the right. And, and it's uh, something that some urban planners and architects uh, have been studying in order to understand how this notion of transculturation could be understood also in the city and from uh, the way in which people uh, themselves are inhabiting the city. Um, as I was saying before, the notion of transculturation uh, uh, started uh, independently from other post-colonial critical positions are probably better known uh, across the world, those relating to French colonialism or those related to uh, British colonialism, such as Homi Baba. And in many cases, there's been an attempt to compare transculturation with notions like hybridity, you know, that you see here, that is one of the main concepts used by Baba, no? Baba saying that hybridity is a problematic uh, of colonial representation and individuation that reserves the effects of colonialist disavowal so that the other denied knowledges enter upon the dominant discourse and estrange the basis of its authority, its rule of recognition. No? This kind of discourse that I think is, is very ingenious in, in, in some ways and very relevant and, and it develops ideas that has, have been widely spread in post-colonial thinking, like that the assimilation of metropolitan works, uh, the, the, let's say Western works, tradition and genders in colonial context, and that hybridizing them, and by doing that, they undermine the authority and coherence of the colonizing processes with greater effectiveness than open resistance. So this is one of the recipes of, of Baba, or the dissolution becomes a twofold process by which the colonizer not only discursively conceives the colonized, but somehow the colonized in turn also conceives the colonizer. No? So this kind, I think, very intriguing and very relevant thinking on post-colonial uh, uh, kind of uh, theory and, and critical uh, uh, thinking that somehow didn't arrive to a good port in many cases in architecture uh, because hybridity was something that in many cases was derived as something else and it's something that is not only part of our time, it's historically happened since the beginning of the idea of creating nation states you know, and how they should be supported by a very cohesive and a strong cultural identity. Um, I remember for instance in like a familiar example for me, that is the 1929 exhibition in Seville, uh, where uh, there was a representation of all Latin American countries. Uh, they were, in a way, uh, uh, they were asked to produce uh, uh, pavilions with a national architecture. 
No, so I mean, for instance, the one in Mexico was very explicit. You have to produce in the competition for the pavilion, you have to produce a national architecture. No one knew what was that, you know, national architecture, what is that? Guatemala, national architecture, actually built by a guy from Granada in Spain, right? national architecture as well. Um, and the question is that this guy, Manuel Amabilis, that he was not only an architect, but also an archeologist, he uh, tried to do that by putting together pieces that he has found in his archeological excavations. Like, let's say he was referencing Palenque, he was referencing uh, Uxmal, he was referencing especially Mayan architecture, and he had a book in what he was able to explain, this is coming from this building, this is coming from this building, this is coming from this building. So this is a hybrid architecture, putting pieces from different precedents of historical architecture that for some people was a hybrid, a hybrid that was able to be post-colonial because also was claiming, uh, let's say, the uh, legacy of the indigenous people. But the reality is that this is not hybridity in the terms that we were discussing before. This is not transculturation as a process. This is historical eclecticism. This is something else. And I don't think that this is really representing our kind of national, kind of cultural. It is a kind of frustrated attempt to produce such a reflection of how should be the culture of modern Mexico or of modern Guatemala. And the second thing, I think that we have to be very careful about how we understand, and this is our contemporary example. I've been traveling around the world for some time. I'm always enjoyed to see which is the version of McDonald's for each kind of region or context, uh, the Macarabia. There is a Spanish kind of Machiverica with Spanish, uh, it has a bit of a Spanish ham, but also uh, just uh, uh, pork uh, fillet uh, inside. Um, when, when Baba is saying that hybridity by, in a way, adapting the met metropolitan uh, discourse to the local context is confronting it, I'm not so sure that it is so much undermining the power or the hegemony of that colonial force. To the contrary, and this is something that has been further theorized in Latin America, hybridity has been, in many cases, the logic of colonization, the way in which the colonizer goes deeper into the soul of the people. So it is not the way of responding to that. It's the way in which the colonizer and the colonial mind is able to go deeper and deeper. So the power of McDonald's or whatever is going deeper because it's taking also features from the local culture in the same way that, I don't know, uh, the Bible was translated to Quechua in order to get deeper into the indigenous populations or the way in which, for instance, it is a very famous passage of uh, The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, Korth, the, the, Korth, the, the guy who was uh, getting uh, more uh, ivory than anyone else in Congo, was doing that because he was using not only industrial means of exploitation, but he was using religious means of exploitation, so getting deeper into the religious beliefs of the local people in order to exploit them further. So uh, hybridization of means like industry plus beliefs, industry plus sensitivity is always a very strong, very, very strong tool that the colon colonizer and colonization have been using for many years. So I wouldn't undermine this and I wouldn't say that uh, by hybridizing things or by having hybridized burgers, we are really undermining the power of, of, of this reality. Having said this, uh, I think that by bringing back transculturation, I'm trying to avoid this first eclectic uh, historicism that is so present when we try to represent culture. And I also try to avoid uh, like fixed representations of uh, the, the, a certain uh, local or regional culture. Uh, and saying that basically I'm in a way priming cultural performer or, or practice as something more fluid, something more related to uh, dynamism, time changing than 
a strict cultural representation that is more based on symbolically link, uh, uh, let's say, cultural features. And a priming cultural process over a defined and delimited cultural object. And, and I think that, to put an example, I'm saying that it is not so much about how the hamburger looks like more Arabian or more Spanish, it is what we do with it. It's not about the fact of the hamburger, but it's how we eat the hamburger, how we are sitting or on the floor or in a park. So all the practices around, revolving around these objects are more important for these cultural exchanges and for the representation of these exchanges than the particular object like the hamburger or the building itself. And this is how, what I'm trying to uh, develop with this theory. So, okay, so I don't know if it's more or less clear the, the principle, uh, if you have any questions so far, or we'll continue because uh, what I want to do now is how we translate this to architecture, what we can do as architect, okay? Because in many cases we talk about very, very big things, you know, uh, global capitalism or the market, uh, the social condition, the ethos, the, but then we don't know what to do as designers. And I, won't go, I want to go down to the practice of architecture, and what we can do as architects, and I'm going to be a bit propositional in that sense. Uh, and first of all, I'm going to show two, uh, let's say, opposing uh, strategies. Well, both are coming from uh, Latin American uh, traditions or architectural references. The first is related to probably the most successful avant-garde in, in Latin America, one that was further uh, exported to other regions. So it started in Mexico, muralism, the, 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 this painting of murals by Rivera, Orozco, Siqueiros, but also it, it started to invade Ecuador, Guatemala, Colombia, so it was probably the most successful and the most uh, uh, recognizable artistic uh, expression in Latin America in modern times. Um, Diego Rivera himself, uh, being a cubist, uh, a cubist uh, painter before becoming a muralism, he said that he wanted to reverse what he was doing as a, a cubist painter. He was saying that when I was a cubist painter, I was trying to uh, put into one canvas all the different faces, all the different views of one single object. What I'm trying to do now is putting all the multiple realities of Mexico that is what he's trying to describe here in one single view. So it's in a way for him reversing that process and using public buildings, and this is very important because this is always, this is the National Palace in Mexico with this very important painting of the history of Mexico. So the building is going to be supporting this and the building is going to be communicating this cultural plurality that is happening in Mexico. And actually, there was an architect uh, very well known in, in, in Mexico. He was a very close friend of Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, that is Juan Orman, and he developed this building that could be, let's say, an advanced uh, kind of development of the previous concept where the painting is integrated as a mosaic of stones, you see here, and also he's developing a very kind of canonical international style building. No? This is the Library of Uman. UNAM is a very straightforward modernist building that is clad with this mosaic that is representing the history of knowledge in Mexico, uh, incorporating uh, knowledge from indigenous people, knowledge from, uh, let's say, uh, colonial times, knowledge in modern Mexico and abroad. It was a, a building that was highly celebrated, for instance, by Hitchcock, the, the, the architectural historian in the international style 50 years after when he was putting this building as, as an example of how modernism was able to adapt itself to uh, all the territories, you know, like the, the, for instance, Mexico. But the reality is that only a couple of years after uh, uh, O'Gorman finalized this work, he was 
publicly rejecting it. And it was very curious because he was saying, okay, first it looks like an American guy look, uh, wearing a, an indigenous Mexican dress, so it doesn't make any sense. It's like when you go to uh, Tijuana and you get your poncho, no? and they say, okay, I'm a Mexican now. And so it's this kind of, so he was saying something of that kind. And in a way, he was saying, okay, I'm trying to represent the plurality of culture in Mexico, but I noticed that I was mainly when working with indigenous population, uh, referencing Mexica people, not the one that were dominating the Mexico Valley. But I was living behind the Olmecas, and I was living behind the Mayans, and I was living behind the people who came from Ireland because he was originally from Ireland. I was living behind this and this and this and that, and he noticed that it was a frustrating attempt to try to represent culture in this way, or the plurality of culture. You can add more and more and more, and now I would put the Jews, we put the, it doesn't matter. You are always going to leave some, someone, uh, you know, uh, aside. And the more people you include, the more clear it's going to be that you are leaving something or you are leaving someone outside of it. You know, so, so this frustration, it is what is leading me to another alternative way to approach cultural plurality in uh, modern societies and probably how we can work with this in contemporary uh, cities. And I'm going to go to the work of Lina Bobardi. Bobardi uh, being herself an expat going to Brazil, coming from Italy, uh, very well related to a local population, uh, knowing very well the local context, maybe you know a bit about that. And um, Brazil itself being one of the most uh, diverse ethnically and culturally and racially uh, countries in Latin America. And I think that the fact that some of the examples that I'm using are coming from Brazil is, is not uh, arbitrary, but probably this kind of diversity uh, made this architecture possible. Um, and Lina herself, I think that he was representing this in, in her house, uh, Casa de Vidrio, that is shown here, and how, in, in a certain way, uh, he never tried to represent uh, uh, culture through, let's say, the implementation of a certain facade, what is relying again on uh, the, the, the symbolic value of whatever we can read, you know, in uh, the language of architecture. The, the language of architecture is almost devoid of any meaning, and architecture, what it's doing is acting as a, a support for the culture of practice to unfold and to be able to negotiate different positions by themselves. So you see how the original modernist kind of house, oops, sorry, start to be populated in different ways, adding this kind of different layouts. I would like to see that each of these things, because furniture in many cases is able to trace how life is. Not so you see how you go to a sofa and you see almost the, the empty, you know, kind of the void of the person who was sitting before. You, know, you feel that there is a kind of the trace of inhabitation. So all these things are representing different ways of inhabiting. Some of them more colonial, some of them more indigenous, some of them probably more modern, but they are changing through time, they are negotiating themselves through time, they are practice, they are fluid, they are dynamic, they are a process. So I think that this kind of changing of the way in which you inhabit the house, it is more relevant to discuss what is transculturation in architecture than trying to do this symbolic facade, trying to incorporate all the different ways in which culture could be represented. I think that what is happening here is that again, the cultural practice, the way in which we inhabit, is the thing that is really representing what is culture today. And I think that this has also translation to uh, the, the city and how this idea of different ways of inhabiting, different ways of uh, positioning yourself towards the city can have a manifestation in buildings such as the must be in Sao Paulo, a building that uh, is interesting because first it's in a very kind of rough, it's, it's a very tough 
the avenue. I don't know if you know Avenida Paulista that is coming here. It's, it's a not very welcoming place. And, and then suddenly she decided to push the program in two different ways, that is going up and going down, and liberating this space that is a space that is going to be appropriated by the people. Um, and I like this drawing because in a way I think that it's really addressing what I'm trying to say. Architecture itself doesn't rely on language in order to express culture, but it's all this that is happening, frame articulated by architecture, where you have this kind of seemingly uh, carnivalesque experience of people performing very weird things. You know, and you say, this is the way in which Lina Bobardi was thinking about a, a future appropriation of, of this space. There are sculptures, there are playgrounds, there are people doing I don't know what. And architecture is only articulating this, articulating a relationship with the city, a city that, as I'm saying, is not an easy one, it's full of conflict, so the scale of this space is going to be relevant, the way that you are aligning yourself and liberating that back, the way in which you are programming. So you are going to guarantee that it's going to be presence of people happening here. So all these very minimal kind of architectural decisions are the ones that are going to be relevant to generate a space where people are presenting themselves. They are not represented by the architect, architecture, but they are presenting themselves as different positions towards the city uh, while, you know, performing their everyday life or most desired activities. So this picture of, I mean, it's a weird space somehow, but, but you see sort of sleeping after hangover, someone, I don't know, reading poetry, this guy is Probably, yes, okay, it's raining, I have to be here, the police. <laughs> there is someone selling stuff. I think that it manifests this idea that probably what we have to do as architects is to engage with the possibility of generating spaces in which this plurality might happen. Um, there are means by which we can contribute to this uh, kind of architecture. It's about a certain mastery of form in terms of how you're articulating the relationship to the city itself, that as I'm saying, is not a neutral territory, or you are also negotiating the different degrees of intimacy of the space that is very different, uh, this one from the one that is happening behind, no open to the Belvedere, no? so there are also an articulation of different uh, conditions, no? different ambience here, here, here that the building is able to produce and is able in that way uh, uh, to, in a way, um, uh, articulate the different uh, relationships to the city and to the ways in which the people inhabit the, inhabit the city by themselves. I think that this architecture is not isolated in the case of uh, Maspi. You can find references in Villanova Artigas, um, it's a building that I always like because it doesn't have any door. It's, again, a very simple gesture of articulating spaces and, in a way, guaranteeing that there are going to be different conditions for people to relate to the building and to relate to themselves. That, that is what happens here. So, so it's just by manipulating the slabs, manipulating the scale, manipulating this very minimum resources of architecture that we are producing a space that is mainly based in this idea that the building is not representing the people. The people are able to represent themselves to the way in which they inhabit the space. And the simultaneous presence of these people in this space is making this, or is producing this idea of cultural plurality that I was talking about from the beginning. It also affected other places like uh, Cuba. I think that it's not by chance that Cuba is a place where there is also a tremendous mix of, of different uh, cultures and ethnic backgrounds and probably also uh, a place where you can find another architecture that is not relying on any kind of figurative gesture or any symbolic uh, kind of uh, gesture to 
represent culture, but it's only this uh, very strict articulation of different conditions to architectural form and their relationship to each other that become uh, relevant. I don't know if I have the time to talk a bit more or not. Some time, I'm going to be very quickly, um, but I wouldn't like to be um, compare with these architects. I'm, <laughs> I, I don't think I'm uh, close or our office is close to the, I think, excellence that the architecture of Villanova Artigas or Lina Bobardi achieved, but uh, in some ways we were inspired with uh, this or by this idea of a formal articulation and how architecture is above all the mastery of this scale in which you want relations to happen. And, and form is one of the means by which you are defining that. A form that could be like a superimposition of different typologies that is happening in this house that is basically working with walls and the wall might be very straightforward saying okay this is public this is private in order for the private to uh, let's say uh, grow and to unfold we need to make this very straight separation and then the life is going to unfold uh, behind so form is dividing these conditions in a, in a very explicit way, or sometimes it's not the wall, it is the floor and the roof, while you want to say, okay, there is a continuity of the common ground, but at the same time there is articulation of it, so you can have different conditions on a high rise that is happening through how uh, the disposition of the balcony is able to generate an alternative correlation or interrelation between people that is normally not happening in the high rise. So, uh, so we've been interested in form as a way of articulating uh, human relations and different ways of inhabiting both the city and architecture itself. And I would like to talk about three projects that developed this idea in three different ways. One is a house in Spain. I think that this goes back to how uh, domesticity needs to be rethought today. And it's a very peculiar project because uh, the uh, client is a guy of 75 years, so he's in a way old. He knows that he's not going to be here for very long, so he thinks that his house is going to be thought for the people who is going to come later, which is something difficult. No? How, how are you going to produce something that is not for me, that is for someone I'm God, I'm able to see the future? No, I don't know. <laughs> so, but this is part of the role of the architect, to be able to produce an architecture that is not only for the people who are now today, but it's also for the people that is going to come later. The, the context is this kind of suburbia in, in Seville. And what we propose is, again, say architectural form is relevant in terms of defining, let's say, areas, conditions for living, some more intimate, some more kind of interrelated to infrastructure, some of them more public, but then we will like to have a certain flexibility within these different kind of bands that we are creating. So this is a superimposition of all the different layouts that we were thinking about for this house, not only in the present, but also in the future. These are some of the things we were thinking. So the guy is living by himself, so it's the dream house. I'm happy, I'm living alone. Then the sister, the, sorry, the daughter, uh, got a divorce, he's coming with his kids to live with him, so we need to rearrange the house. Then there is the, the kids of the kids coming also, and more people coming together, two families living together, anarchy, we don't know what is going on. So we were testing all this with this idea that we keep a structure that is in a way organizing the house, but at the same time we are keeping that flexibility that is not saying or prescribing how you have to leave the house. So architecture what it's doing is articulating these different possibilities of inhabitation, these different sensitivities towards how you want to live in your own home. Um, the walls were something that we want to keep, uh, keep as solid, you know, to really define uh, a certain boundaries between the conditions. So it's a brick wall, but it's a structural wall at the same time, as you see here. But we wanted to create this kind of uh, connection, this connection that I think was important. Each of the bands is going to be independent. 
You see one here, another one here, another one here, but each of them uh, are going to be somehow connected in a way that with this kind of enfilade that is a bit diagonal, you're able to foresee a bit of what is happening in the next space, but you are not totally disclosing it. So there is a certain tension between, okay, I know there is a connection between the different ways in which I'm appropriating the space, but there is an intimacy and there is a kind of disconnection that allows me to feel free to adopt the form of living that I prefer. So, so there is always a form used not in a very straightforward way, but always getting this tension that I think is more rich and is more interesting for architecture. These are all the views. This is Nuria, my partner. Because uh, Canais Bombardero is with Nuria, who is sitting here today. And these are all the aspects of the house that I don't have the time to talk about. Uh, and I have two other projects very briefly. The second one, if the, the first one is related to how form is able to uh, articulate different forms of inhabitation. In this case, what I'm talking about is the idea of form as able to articulate the relationship to a certain context. And in this case, the context is in the middle of the mountains. That is a context that is, uh, I think, not close to the one here. The mountains are very different, but uh, it talks about this idea of territory and what do you do with an architecture in the territory. And in this case, it's a very, very, very small public building. It's a medical center that is in a very strange location. It's probably this location in between uh, this sports court, uh, a road, trees that are centenary trees, the trees that are lasting longer than architecture, which is interesting as well. Normally we think about vegetation as something ephemeral, but here vegetation is lasting more. And, and how in this uh, kind of uh, environment and this kind of very idyllic for pigs, you know, as you see here, this is the place in which is produced the best ham, the, the Spanish ham in, in, in Spain. And the, uh, these uh, pigs are eating the fruits of, of these olm trees that you are seeing over here. So the, the form is used here in order to establish a certain relationship to, to this condition, no, a condition that includes, uh, as I'm saying, these uh, different uh, accidents <laughs> to a point. And, and the program is sorted out in a very straightforward way. These are the two medical uh, offices, and these are the toilets, and this is an office. And, and as you see, uh, for instance, the, the, the tree, you know, the relationship with the existing vegetation that I'm saying, probably the building is going to be turned down and the vegetation is going to stay. And, and the vegetation is a way in which the, the architecture is constructed. So. The, the tree is used uh, as a shading system for the windows. The windows are high, so I think that form implies also the location of a window in the sense that this window is, is nice for the office because the guys are here. They, don't, they are not seen, so you don't want to be seen in a medical center how you are treated, no, and you are not feeling well. So, oh, I have a pain here, and you, everyone is looking at you. Ah, I see you. No, it's a different kind of relationship, and then you are able to see the tree, the mountains, and so on. So the relationship with the tree, I think, is negotiated through form. You see, this is how it becomes a screen. It's becoming also like the place where the pigs come. Actually, the, the, the building is full of stains from the pigs. I like that because they uh, contributed to the image of the building. It is also the way of signaling the, the entrance. While the part in which you are related to the court, everything is this kind of, this is also people contributing to the production of this space because all the kids playing with the balls, they are producing a very nice uh, polka dot uh, <laughs> facade over here. But, but you see that, in a way, this is very kind of blind wall that is very different from the one of the tree, that is very different from the one of the road, that it was meaningless to say, okay, I'm going to put a uh, kind of sidewalk here, so this continuing like the road in order to get into the into the office. And each of these formal decisions are related to the way in which the building is going to be interrogating the context and articulating it. As you see over here, here, and, and I think that when I saw this picture for the first time, I was very happy because in a way the building is a bit older now, but, but the people is appropriating it, putting very kind of kitsch 
uh, benches, uh, this, uh, the signaling of the regional uh, kind of government and all that. And I think that it's fine. I mean, it's fine. It works because, in a way, the formal attitude, it is what is relevant. And all these things, they could be, they couldn't be. It doesn't matter. They are not really the things that are uh, relevant in the way of uh, producing architecture here. The things that are relevant are this kind of formal articulation, and it is expected for the people to appropriate, to see, to come, for the pigs to stay in all this, to the kids to stay in all the other part. And I think that the confidence in form allows you to have all these kind of a small appropriations of people with, uh, without being very scared. You know? Normally, you go to any kind of architectural magazine, everything is extremely designed, you cannot live. And I remember uh, Picasso used to say that he, he likes to live in houses where he can spit on the floor. It's maybe going too far, but in, in a way, you cannot live in a place that's over designed. You need to have this kind of idea that it is the people who is constructing the domestic space, it's not the architect. And I think that you need to leave that room for the people to uh, complete the work in some certain way. And then this is the latest, one of the latest things we are working on is a large project in San Salvador, in El Salvador. It's our first large also Latin American building. It's a competition that we won a couple of years ago. And it is in the center, real center of San Salvador. Here you have the National Palace. That is a gigantic neoclassical building. Here you have uh, the Metropolitan Cathedral, also gigantic building. And this is uh, the, 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 the square that is in front of the Metropolitan Cathedral. As you see, very lively area, full of people, full of informal appropriation, full of people uh, practicing the city in many different ways. Informality is very relevant in Latin America. Every time you have a canopy, you will have people, you know? It's inevitable, um, and, and I like that this is happening. You know, it's, it's a very, very simple formal gesture. It's able to generate a life in the city. You know? so, so we were looking at these kind of ideas, you know, how with minimal means you were able to make the people inhabit, contribute to the city, and contribute to how uh, the, the civil, civic role of architecture could be seen through the very use of the people of it. So this is the building that we were providing. It's uh, also a building that is commemorating the 200 years of the independence of San Salvador. So there was a pavilion that is from the 19th century that it was is going to be rebuilt. That is at the entrance of the building. There is a another, I don't know, 200 years old tree here. So again, trees <laughs> lasting more than buildings in some cases. And this is what we are proposing that in a way is bringing to the right scale, that is the scale of these gigantic buildings, the scale of the pavilion that by itself it was like a miniature and, and we needed to in a way uh, do the transition between the small scale of the pavilion and the large scale of this part of the city. Uh, this is the pavilion that actually we had to redo uh, after the competition with all the detail is uh, another example of uh, historical eclecticism that we were mentioning before that doesn't represent San Salvador at all and actually was built by a French architect. And he was saying that he was using uh, uh, Mayan references in the tiles. Actually, they are uh, Mexica. They are not so total disaster, but <laughs> doesn't matter. We have to rebuild it. Uh, because it's part of the, the commission that you see here. And then this is how we are articulating it through uh, the superimposition of three different typologies that have to do to three ways of being in the city. Uh, one of the spaces that work are those in which you stay. And you don't stay because you are consuming, but you stay because you are fine. Uh, and I think that we need to really create a spaces that, that are public and you stay in there. Normally, the public space is where you are, uh, the place where you are circulating, you no? Know? And, and it's a shame. So for that purpose, around the beauty of the pavilion, we decided to have a space where people could stay with water. It's, it's a hot climate, so people enjoy being around the water, being uh, 
looking each other with a bit of a stepping, with a covering, very important. The covering is always going to allow life to happen. As I said, if you go to most of Latin American cities, every time, even if it's a super nasty highway, people is going to be down doing stuff. Then there is another typology that is a typology related to congregation um, that is uh, generated through this kind of cloister that you see here. It's a cloister that is also thought for people to appropriate in a certain way, but that is also dividing or articulating two different conditions with the use of architectural form. Um, and I like this solution this, uh, of the cloister made with uh, walls and not columns because it's properly dividing these two conditions. One that is here, that is dark, that is in a way silent, that is a typical one that you have in a cloister. You walk around and you feel a certain intimacy. And this other one that is the courtyard itself, that is more lively, that is full of light, that is uh, this other experience. And that going from here to here it can be rearranged in different ways. You see here, it's a com more modern mechanical architecture that you see that it could be converted into an exhibition hall or also uh, auditorium or whatever you need. You see here the scale of the building, how it's matching with or scaling up the, the, the pavilion that we were mentioning before. This is the pavilion, the, the building acting as a background for it with people around, you see. This is the cloister and how the walls are defined in these two spaces. So you have to walk all the depth of the wall in order to go to the other kind of condition. These are different kind of arrangements of the space. Um, some of them you also consider unfolding the, 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 this, this building inside to the courtyard, so generating these big spaces, uh, space for performances. And so I don't want to be, in a way, exemplary of anything. I'm trying to, in a way, uh, respond to the question of how uh, we can, as architects, uh, have a role in the construction of a city that probably not necessarily more democratic, but it is trying to offer a experience of democracy by saying that while allowing all this plurality to happen by the practice of, of the people, then you're able to showcase that plurality to others. You're able to, in a way, uh, be aware of that plurality, so you are making culturally more sustainable uh, uh, urban environments. And I think that this is everything that I wanted to say. Um, thank you for, for your time. Uh, thank you so much, Francisco, for your wonderful presentation. We're going to open the floor for questions from the audience for 10 minutes. If anybody would like to share something or has a question to ask. Uh, hi. Uh, you spoke about, in the beginning, about uh, moving from multi-communitarism to multiculturalism. Uh, and you explained through your uh, presentation about this transculturation uh, thing. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking about Beirut, which is a capital that is into multi-communitarism more than multiculturalism, uh, where architects are uh, playing the role of enhancing this um, clo closure and private uh, places where you can live in a building where you have your own pool, your own sport uh, thing, your own thing. You don't go out of your building because everything is available in your building. So th this way of seeing things, it's opposing or avoiding this uh, melting pot that you are uh, proposing in the, through architecture, through uh, uh, sp public spaces. We don't really have lots of public spaces. My question is, how would you, as, a, as someone expert, 
um, uh, advise if, if those architects came to you and said, uh, what would be our guidelines to start building somewhere, uh, knowing uh, that our cultural also spaces are also private, they're in universities. Uh, universities have their own museums, apart from a national museum and another one in Ashrafiye. I don't see a, a private, a public museum accessible to everyone. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean that we don't have um, public um, multicultural spaces such as popular, popular ones such as Burj Hamoud or maybe Marm Khayel or anything. But as someone who's expert, if someone is an architect came to you and said, listen, I am asked by the hopefully, public uh, authority to move from this multi-communitarism to multiculturalism. What advices could you, what guidelines could you give them so that they could take in their profession uh, the, your advices in consideration? Um, thank you for, for the question. I think that is a very relevant one because in many, many cases, uh, you, you can't speak for a long time about the uh, let's say how good these uh, spaces are and so on, but they're not always easy to, to, to be implemented. And I would say that in, in most of the cases, uh, at least I would say in all the cases that I know, mm, there is a need for a very strong uh, political will and a municipality that is really looking after that kind of idea. Um, the most well-known case is, uh, in recent history, is the one of Barcelona with a municipality with the advice of Oriol Boigas, who was really thinking about a civic city uh, that was relying on the production of public buildings and public spaces. But that was a huge investment and a super strong political, uh, uh, let's say, uh, drive that was derived from uh, the, 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 let's say, the post-Franco uh, dictatorship environment. So only because of that it was possible in that time, but the reality is that this same kind of uh, idea has been, I wouldn't say exported, but tried in different ways in other cities, especially in Latin America, in the case of Colombia, the Medellin made a great effort with uh, Santiago Fajardo that was also a very kind of uh, charismatic politician uh, that has been there for, for many years and that he promoted the idea that if people had uh, better public spaces, they are going to have a better image of themselves. So they are going to, in a way, um, take more care about their own city. And actually was working quite well and uh, statistics <laughs> also were showing how the crime rate in Medellin dramatically fell uh, from the 90s to, to what is today, and actually today is even a very touristic city, and it was done to this, uh, as I'm saying, um, mayor that was really fostering uh, this idea. Uh, in the case of San Salvador, uh, it's the same as Najib Bukele, that now is the president of the, the Republica of uh, Salvador, who uh, had this idea of generating this uh, publicness and, and these new spaces for the city. So he was promoting that uh, with a lot of energy. But I understand that it's not, uh, unless you have the, this very, very strong political will, it's not very easy to implement these kind of plans and you will have always people opposing them saying, well, we don't have the culture here for this kind of a space. People is not going to respect it. It's not going to work. Uh, uh, there is always this kind of uh, mm, debate with uh, these kind of spaces, but uh, the only way to, uh, to, to, to start with these kind of ideas is by proving them. So I think that the only thing that I can advise uh, as an architect is to start with one and then see where, how it goes. And normally, something that I'm not mentioning, uh, time is important. Uh, sometimes it's not necessary to build the entire compound. And, and I think that this is also very relevant. Real estate development, they, they lose a lot of money if they are not built into a certain amount of time. So they want to be quick and they want to have the building as a whole as soon as possible and the landscaping and everything 
ready for two years, one year and a half, whatever. But uh, with this kind of more public uh, operations, you can do a step by step. You first liberate a ground, you generate a, a phone time where people can come, then you generate something else, you propose a program that is backing up that space. So you are building step by step a sense of that public space that people is getting used to it with the pass of the time and you are not imposing something uh, you know that is like a UFO no, coming to the city and say okay this is you know, the new public space but you are stepping down that and then facing it to a way in which people can naturally appropriate and then the planning of it can also be reflective of that uh, progressive appropriation of the people of the space. So, so this is the only advice that I can have is try with one <laughs> and not doing it at once but staging it in order to allow people to know that space, appropriate, make changes accordingly and so on and so forth. We have time for two more questions. Okay, at the back. Thank you for the lecture. Um, I'm actually kind of interested about um, the high-rise example that you were giving. Um, you know, high-rises actually play an important part in the urban fabric of a city. And since we're talking about culture, I'm just wondering how high-rises could actually contribute to uh, the cultural identity of a certain place. Yeah. Um, to tell you the truth, it's, uh, it's a good question because it's a very difficult one. I, I, in general terms, when, when you think about the high rise, it's almost like the opposite to uh, what I was saying with this last example. You know, like uh, the high rise is one building that has a very small impact on the ground floor. That is normally the floor in which everyone comes together. You know, the, the, the ground floor is that the one that, in a way, is more able to engage with the social fabric. The more you go up, the more difficult it becomes for the people to. Uh, gather. So you have the case of, uh, I don't know if you know the walkie-talkie in London by Rafael Vignoli that uh, the municipality said, okay, you can build this thing, but you need to provide a public space to compensate uh, the, the space that you're taking from the city. So we decide to put that public space on the top of the building. So to get to that space, you have to go through a security control, then they look at your backpack, they uh, you have to show your uh, passport and you can go up and what you have over there is a cafeteria actually that looks like a normal restaurant. It is a public space, but actually it is much uh, more related to a private kind of development. So this kind of experience, uh, experience is really disconnecting uh, the, 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 the social fabric of the city from, from, from the building. And I think that high rise is always this challenge you know, that is very difficult to, 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 to manage in, in that sense. So uh, I don't think that what we were doing in that building was in a way solving the problem, but maybe trying to ameliorate some of the consequences. You know, like if you uh, have read this uh, novel by uh, Ballard, you know, the high rise, you know, it's quite dystopian, you know, <laughs> how the life in a building that is a high rise can be a total nightmare. There is a moment in which the the neighbors start to talk to each other from the balcony. And I found always this moment, the only moment of a kind of, in a way, uh, spontaneous uh, interrelation between people. And this is the only thing that we were trying to develop. Okay, we cannot develop an interrelationship between the city and the building because it's, it's hard, because the impact or the friction between the building and the ground floor is minimum. Um, and it's very difficult to do that. We can try, we are, allocating program in the ground floor, we have a sky service, we have things like that, but we are aware of, of the difficulties of, of that, and we are putting much more effort in this uh, interrelation between neighbors and programs that are linking these interrelations and so on. But as I'm saying, it's not really solving the problem, only probably ameliorating the consequences of, of that problem. Um, I'm sorry that I don't have a, a better answer, but I will work on it. Yeah. <laughs> One last question. Um, 
It's a, it's a question about form. And um, about what you were saying a bit at the beginning, uh, questions of transculturation, hybrid Jason, hybrid situations. Um, for you working in other countries of other cultures, uh, from Spain to Salvador, uh, seeing this project or the one in, uh, I think, was Nigeria or which country you had in power. Uh, I don't remember exactly the Nairobi. So I'm, I'm wondering if a way of avoiding the, or not entering at the problematics of historical similarities or eclect historical eclecticism or mimetism of forms that correspond to existing culture, as you've shown before with the copying of the mosaics or things by the modernists like uh, Ogorman, uh, is the way of avoiding these problems uh, dematerializing form in a way that we go back, like I'm seeing there, to questions of structures and function instead of approaching real forms and architecture that sometimes relate to maybe historical typologies or uh, well, questions of identity in terms of architecture. When I see here, well, series of walls that try to address a situation but not be a legible form that would go back to a particular history. I don't know if my question is clear. Do you understand what I'm saying? No, no, no. Um, um, this is something that I've been thinking about, actually, because uh, in a way, when, when you're using form in the way that we describe it, uh, it's inevitable to think that you are relating back to, to typology. In a sense, typology that is not driven by function, I think, but it is uh, related to uh, this idea of form as a system of relations, no? like a courtyard house establishes a certain relationships between the people who is inhabiting the house, which is very different from the relationships that may occur in a modernist or conventional, let's say, apartment block, no? that you have a corridor, no? and, and that kind of relationship, the one of the corridor, is very, very different from the one of the courtyard. And, and, and of course, when you are working with form and form that is in a way reduced to this kind of uh, organization of relationships, you, you are probably going to, to, to references in the history of architecture. But what I'm saying are references that are not so much related to uh, symbolic representation, but are more related to forms of, of, of ways of living. No, um, and there is always a decision. It's almost impossible to uh, eliminate form. I, many people tried before. I don't think that it's successful. It's better to acknowledge the, the form that you're working with. And by doing that, you're also able to give people uh, a reference from which to relate. So if you are working with a courtyard house, the people, they acknowledge that they are in a courtyard house and they are able to live accordingly in the way that they want, but in confrontation or in relation to that set of, or this organization that you have uh, provided. If you try to dissolve it and you try to do this kind of uh, dream of the open plan, probably what you're doing is uh, dissolving also the uh, possibility for people to really position themselves uh, towards the architecture that is being proposed. And I think that if you remove that uh, clarity in the formal organization of architecture, you are also removing certain of the capacity of the people to appropriate and to inhabit that uh, uh, typology. And as I'm saying, typology is a courtyard, but a courtyard can become, uh, I wouldn't say a hospital, but it could be, actually I live in a courtyard house that is the result of a church. It was the, the church itself is a courtyard now, and they're surrounding, and, and of course it implies a way of living. Of course, I mean you have all the neighbors looking at you every morning. Uh, no, it's, I mean it's not the same than the flat. You have your corridor. You don't care. You don't see anyone, and 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 I think that what is important is that we are aware of the forms we are working with. We are aware of the conditions that we want to articulate. How we want to separate different kind of. Uh, conditions within uh, a kind of uh, inhabitation structure. And, and of course, it implies a structure, it implies construction, it implies other things, but, uh, but I think that if these things are clear for the people in a way that they, they are clear 
in the way that they are presented uh, uh, as, a, as a spatial organization, they, they have more possibility for, for them to, to be modified, transform, and then the totally open plan that in most of the cases is, is quite misleading. And this is the experience of how these super gigantic open holes uh, have worked in the history of architecture. And I would say just to, to finish with that, that in many cases, uh, a, a square is working, working well as a square in a city because it has certain limits. They can be diffused, they can be diffused, they can be of many ways, but, but there is a certain intensity in the way that the courtyard is inhabited because of the limits of the courtyard or the square. If you have a gigantic vast area that can be, oh, you can do whatever you want, probably people will be too scared. No, and I think that this uh, mastery of the scale of the relationships is probably the most important thing to, to, to address when trying to work in the way that we try to work. Thank you so much, Francisco.